Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the Making Milestones podcast. I'm recording this new podcast just nine days after my last episode. So shout out to me for being productive. Let's give me a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Anyways, today's topic is a really important one that I hope a lot of people will relate to because I wanted to talk about the process of changing your identity and having to like basically let go of your identity and rebuild yourself from the ground up when you start to approach horse training and how you view horses in a different way. And this happens for a lot of people when they go from training in a highly traditional way to learning about horse behavior and starting to apply more positive reinforcement principles and go about their horse training in such a different lens. And you can't really do that without starting to change your entire identity and like how you showed up in the horse world before and it's scary enough to kind of dismantle that sense of self and have to rebuild a new identity that you you might not want to do it like it's an off-putting enough thing that a lot of people would just prefer to stay the same and they don't want to consider that type of change because they're scared of what it might mean for them because they can't really imagine doing things differently than what they have been. Like for me personally, for years, when I, even when I started to first get into horse behavior, I was like, there's no way that I'm going to go like deep diving as hardcore positive reinforcement as some people do. Like I still want to show, I still want to do all these things. And I really truly believe that, but things changed in a way that I didn't predict because how I felt about things and how I viewed the horse world around me fundamentally changed. And initially in the beginning stages of that, it's honestly like a really dark place to be in because you don't really know who you are. You feel lost. You feel like you don't fit in with so much of the horse world and you kind of just feel like a puzzle piece that is in the wrong puzzle box. And it's an uncomfortable place to be and it's a really uncomfortable part of the journey, but it's such a necessary one for kind of having that rebirth and coming out on the other side. And I just wanted to talk about that because I'm hoping that this is something a lot of people can relate to and that it might help bring some people some solace if they're at this like dark stage of the journey where you're like, before you're a complete rebirth, you're just having to let go of parts of yourself that you've held so dear to you for years and that have been so integral to your identity as a horse person. And you're now kind of embracing the idea of something completely new, but something that in embracing it, you have to dismantle aspects of yourself that have been there for a long time, for the entirety of your horse experience in a lot of cases. So that's what we're going to talk about. But before we jump into it, I just need to plug some things because your girl has got to make that bag so that I can pay rent. So thank you for everyone for supporting the podcast. If you're interested in other ways of supporting me, I have an online store where I've just released a bunch of different graphic design collections that are on shirts, sweaters, and more. There's a barefoot collection. There's a clicker trainer collection. There's an equine sciences collection. There's an ethical equestrians collection. There's a lot. You can check that out at the link down below in this podcast or shopmilestoneeq.com. That's shopmilestoneeq.com. And I also sell bitless and bitted bridles on there, as well as other equestrian apparel, having some huge clearance sales on 2023 apparel. So get your stuff for super cheap before it's gone because I'm running out of storage space and I am just but one human being trying to run a store out of my house. So please help a girl out. Also, if you're interested in more in-depth tutorials, I have my Patreon that you can subscribe to for as little as a dollar a month. But to access all the tutorials, you have to go into one of the higher tiers, which is just $16 a month. And you can do that at patreon.com slash SD Equus. And the link is also down below in my description. I also do monthly Q&As on there and post behind the scenes and other things. So you can check that out on there. I also have a tip jar on PayPal if people want to do a one-time thing. Or I have webinars available on my website for a one-time purchase. The most recent of which was an anxiety and tension one about like helping anxious intense horses under saddle and the processes that I use and the recording of that is available on my website which is milestoneequestrian.ca and that will also be linked down below 
And as always, if you enjoyed this podcast, please share it because sharing it really helps spread the word and it helps me continue doing what I'm doing. And I appreciate that immensely. So thank you everyone for your support. And let's just jump into the topic. So I've really kept it no secret that I grew up doing things with horses in an extremely traditional way. I started out riding and showing Arabian horses and I was taught to do things in a very punishing way when things didn't go my way. I was taught to use bits and training gadgets as means of problem solving. So like if my horse was heavy in my hands, the solution was to use a harsher bit. I would use draw reins, German martingales, all sorts of different types of training gadgets to get to my goals. And I was taught that that was the normal means of achieving them. So that's kind of the lens that I was coming out of when I really started to find my own way, I guess, is the way to look at it. But I had been taught that all of these band-aid fixes were the way to go. I had been taught that horse stress behaviors were something completely different than they were. And I had been taught that for years. So when I started to kind of move out of that realm and I stepped out of the Arabian horse circuit and started to go more into like hunter jumpers and open breed circuits, I started to learn how differently things were done there. And it's not that there was like an absence of quick training shortcuts or anything like that in those circuits, but it was less of an echo chamber because there was just so many different breeds of horses and people from different walks of life. Whereas I found breed show circuits can be this really big echo chamber where so many people are hush hush about who's doing what wrong and people are willing to look the other way when abusive things happen. And there's training tactics that are really specific to like the breed type that you are showing in. And of course, like people are still willing to look the other way in other circuits, including the open breed circuits like hunter or jumpers. But it's it's a little bit different. Like I was really like in quite the echo chamber where I didn't get a lot of outside outlook on how other people did things. So it was a little bit of a culture shock when I started to step out of that realm and go into something completely different. And I learned lots. I took lessons from different types of traditional trainers and they taught me different ways of doing things. And from there, I started being as quick to adopt the use of harsher bits or training gadgets. However, I still did use like a running martingale every time that I rode basically. And I still would use bits for like if my horse is hard to jump, for example, with my off the track thoroughbred Dallas for a time, he got really rushy over fences because I wasn't properly training him on the flat to be good over fences and he was unbalanced and probably quite stressed. So I put an elevator bit on him and that's not something I would do now, but it was what I learned to be a solution then both from my past experience and from what current trainers were encouraging me to do. And that was the last time that I have purposely like put a bit like that on any of my personal horses was with him. And it was a mistake and I regret it. But after that, and after like I got Milo and kind of started moving into different types of horses, where Milo was this rescue horse that was really difficult and different compared to other horses that I'd worked with. Milo has never been ridden in a bit like that ever. He's never been ridden in draw reins. The most that he's had on training gadget wise for riding was a running martingale but I took that off like years ago because it was not working and he didn't like it and it was making him worse and for lunging I did use the Pessoa lunging system on him a couple of times and side reins and whatnot but I would never put any of that stuff on him again now So he was kind of a huge turning point in my journey as an equestrian where I threw out a lot of the harsher and like band-aid fixes that I had been taught to use for so many years. But he was ultimately the catalyst that led me to studying horse behavior because I didn't understand him. He was quite scary and difficult to deal with when he got upset because rather than like backing down, if you tried to punish him and be harsh with him or get mad at him for things, he would square up with you and be like, okay, let's go, man. And he'd be like ready, guns a blaze, like he would fight you. So I quickly learned that like being harsh and domineering and getting mad at him and trying to punish him when he's scared or stressed or doesn't want to do things just escalated the situation. And I'd never handled a horse like this before because prior to this, any horse that I had, I could be harsh on them in the moment and it would at least get me somewhere temporarily where they'd stop doing it in the moment, even if it caused problems down the road. I'd never had a horse that 
was going to basically reflect back at me the level of aggression that I showed them until I got him. So he was kind of a push where I decided I wanted to go and study equine sciences. And that's where I started my courses through Guelph University and started learning about horses because I wanted to go to post-secondary and I wanted to jump into the horse sciences field. Initially, for years prior to this, I hadn't intended to do this because I was like, it's not going to help me get a job. People don't value this type of education in the horse world. It's just wasted money. And still at the time that I was doing this, I kind kind of thought that. And honestly, still now, I think it to an extent where people don't value that education to the extent that they should, because a lot of people are still denying science actively in the horse world. But anyways, I did it for myself anyways, because it was something that I was interested in and that I wanted to do. And I was doing this kind of at the same time that I was going to regular university classes for like English, psychology and journalism. And that's important because the psychology stuff that I learned for human psychology has a lot of crossover to horse behavioral psychology and just animal psychology in general. And the more I've studied horse behavior, the more I've realized how much of a connection there is between how humans respond to stress and how stress is impactful to our bodies physically, in addition to mental health, and also how it's the same for horses. So those educations have kind of worked in tandem to lead me to really realize, like, despite the fact that there's less research on horses and chronic stress and the types of physical ailments it can cause than there is on humans, I do really believe that chronic stress probably causes a lot of the same types of issues in horses that we see in humans. And even amongst humans, there's this idea that mental health doesn't impact physical health that is largely perpetuated in society, despite the evidence showing otherwise, because, for example, a lot of autoimmune disorders and even cancers and whatnot can be related to chronic stress and trauma. So it's something that impacts you physically as well as mentally when you have these problems. So despite the fact that there's not the same amount of evidence for horses and other animals, I do believe that since they're also a mammalian species, that chronic stress can cause physical issues and that chronic stress and tension under saddle, even if we're just looking at how horses hold tension in their bodies physically, I think that that can contribute to a lot of lamenesses and other problems. And that's something that I firmly believe now. And I was kind of led to that conclusion through my equine sciences education, as well as my fascination with human psychology and the studying that I did in school, as well as outside of it. And that really started to change my perspective. But it happened slowly at first. So like the equine sciences courses changed the way that I went about handling Milo and I became way less punishing. I still predominantly used negative reinforcement for many of the initial years that I was handling him. But I did use positive reinforcement for other things, but I did not use enough of it. I would have been able to bring him along quicker if I had started earlier. But the start of these classes were the catalyst for like a major shift in mentality because basically the deeper I went in equine sciences, specifically horse behavior, the harder it was to maintain certain viewpoints and principles that are so widely held and believed in the horse world, like horses intentionally being naughty and needing to be like put in their place and needing to be domineering and basically being like the alpha dominant type person in the partnership in order to have a well-behaved horse. The more I studied horse behavior and how their brains actually function and how they function both mentally and physically as a species, the harder it became to really justify doing things the way that I always had. And on top of this, I think the biggest shift for me in starting to adopt way more positive reinforcement was the more I read about operant conditioning and how it actually works, like I couldn't answer the question why would my horse enjoy training if I'm just using negative reinforcement? I legitimately couldn't answer that because we're using entirely just the relief from aversives to make them do what we want them to do. And what we're asking them to do is inherently unnatural for them as a species in most cases. So when I looked at it that way, I was like, I don't know. Like, I can't think of a reason why they would enjoy their jobs as if, if this is how I'm going about it. And then I started to get really uncomfortable with that idea because, of course, like we want our horses to enjoy our jobs. We want them to enjoy the time that they spend with us and we want it to be a partnership. But in reality, it's not actually a partnership. So 
like in a lot of cases, in some cases it is, but in reality, a lot of what we do with horses and like the way the vast majority of people were at least initially taught to train horses, it's not a partnership because one side of the partnership has no actual say. If your horse tries to refuse to do something, you don't take no for an answer. And it's not even within the context where when they finally do the thing that you ask, they get rewarded for it and get something really nice. It's just that they get escalated the amount of pressure and discomfort they're caused until they do something and then you stop that and you you relieve them from the escalating amount of discomfort when they finally do what you ask and it oftentimes ends up being like this big fight with the horses like even when i stopped being as punishing like i can remember in circumstances where horses were stressed they didn't want to do what i wanted to do like with milo over fences and that shows where he'd be refusing i would just keep asking him again and again until he finally did it he'd be really stressed i didn't hit him with the whip for refusing but i kept at it until i finally got what i wanted and it was a stressful experience for him where he was really sweaty and always like huffing and puffing afterwards wasn't having a good time like he wasn't enjoying himself so I kind of had this ethical dilemma where I was like I want my horses to enjoy training I want it to be mutually beneficial for both of us and fun for both of us at least most of the time and I couldn't answer that question so then I started to use more positive reinforcement and like kind of experimenting with where I could apply it because initially I honestly had no idea how to train certain things with positive reinforcement and when I was first getting into horse behavior I was kind of stuck at the roadblock where I was like well like if pressure is aversive like how do you teach pressure cues with positive reinforcement do you just not apply any pressure to your horses and I couldn't understand the fact that you could teach a tactile cue without having it have an aversive context if you teach it with positive reinforcement from the get-go and the motivation isn't making the horse respond to an uncomfortable pressure stimulus and instead you're using like the target to get them to move and then they respond to that but at the time I couldn't wrap my head around it so I started to use it more and more I noticed how much better it made Milo for trailer loading and that he was just a way better horse for that how much better my horses learned his tying and just overall how much easier stuff became with them and how much more they looked forward to training with me and actually seemed to want to be there. And I noticed all of these behavioral problems being solved. So that coupled with what I was learning about horse behavior and how horses think fundamentally changed the way that I wanted to do things. Because the more I learned about traditional training methods and like how they actually work and how the horse perceives them, the more I remembered situations for myself where I didn't want to do something. And essentially, I was chastised and bullied into doing it anyways, and pressured and pressured and pressured until I finally did it. And then the pressure was relieved. And I didn't feel good about myself after I ended up dreading those types of circumstances. And it gave me a lot of chronic anxiety to be forced into that situation. And as someone who's neurodivergent, I feel like what happened to me was compounded by that because I thought so differently from people. And it was like so many things that were fundamentally about who I was as a person that people wanted to change because they didn't like it. And that part was really uncomfortable. So I think that that amplified the effect that it had on me, but it gave me a lot of chronic anxiety. It taught me people pleasing behaviors that harmed my mental and physical health long term and put me in a lot of situations where essentially I was just like agreeing to them out of feeling coerced, even in instances where people weren't like outright coercing me to do things because of past experience, I just went through the motions of doing these things because of the coercive aspect of like the past. And it wasn't a good feeling. It impacted my mental health. It made me have chronic anxiety and stress. I had immense social anxiety. I was so worried about making a mistake that, for example, in class, like for so many years, I wouldn't put my hand up to answer something unless I was 100% positive I was right. Because the idea of being wrong was so embarrassing and difficult that I didn't want that to be a risk. And this is because of a conditioning process of it being a big deal if I made a mistake and me being punished in some way, be it from humiliation from peers or the teacher, if I was wrong. And then I thought about how my horse's mistakes were made to be like this big deal and that if they were scared or they were struggling, it was something that I took personally and I responded accordingly because I wanted things to go my way every single training session. And I wasn't factoring in whether they were feeling pain or whether they're just having a bad day or whether they're confused, frustrated or whatever. I didn't consider the horse's experience of training enough for 
the vast majority of my riding career. Like even now it's been a lot less years that I've been more considerate of the horse than it has been where I've just completely written off their capacity to feel and just be their own being that has this individual experience going on. And I have a lot of regrets because of that, because I know that a lot of stuff that I did was unfair. So it was a really hard process to be in because then the more I learned, the more uncomfortable I became at shows, even when I was just spectating, because I started to notice all the behavioral problems and stress going on. Whereas initially, even in the beginning stages of this journey, I was more quick to shrug them off and be like, oh, people are just overreacting. There's no way all of these horses could be stressed. There's no way that it's that rampant of a problem in the industry. People are just overreacting and attributing anything to stress. But the more I learned and delved into it, the more I realized, no, there is like a fundamental problem in the industry with horse stress, that there is this fundamentally broad issue that we're seeing in the horse world where horse stress is so normalized that people don't see it for what it is, that we're taught that it's different things. We're taught it's the horse being naughty. It's We're taught it's them trying to get out of work. And people don't view it as stress, but it is so rampant and prevalent and it's everywhere. And that epiphany was one of the most uncomfortable things I've ever had because it completely altered the way I viewed the horse world. It altered all of those past memories and experiences that I've had with horses, where I remember them really fondly up until learning about how my horse is probably feeling in that moment. It ruined the positive and lovely emotions associated with photos and memories that I had of horses that I would have proudly shared back in the day. But now I look back on it, I see how stressed my horse is in the moment, and I'm just uncomfortable with it. And I'm just like, yikes my horse wasn't enjoying it and it sours all of those experiences so then this is where I saw the identity that I had built for myself as an equestrian just crumble this is where I really saw a huge shift in how I wanted to show up in the horse world and honestly what it resulted in is like it alienated me from like a lot of peers and friends and trainers that I would have initially been okay with and like fine with and friendly with. It resulted in me losing friendships because people didn't like this new perspective that I had. And I had to essentially choose from either hiding that aspect of myself and not sharing my authentic thoughts on my own platforms and pages and just like cleansing what I felt and what I wanted to share to avoid disrupting any bonds that I had built with people and disrupting the types of people who had followed me because of my old content. I had to choose between doing that or being authentic to myself and speaking my truth. And ultimately, obviously, I did end up speaking my truth, but it resulted in a loss of friendships and being perceived in an entirely different way. People changing the way that they labeled me as an equestrian, having my work devalued and written off and shrugged off as just like playing with horses and feeding them cookies and that like I wasn't a real trainer and like all of these things that I worked so hard to build identity wise in the horse world started to crumble because for years, like I did feel on the outskirts from the standpoint of like, I couldn't afford to show as much as some people could. So I didn't have the show record behind my name as a trainer that other people did. And that's something that a lot of people valued the most. So then when I was actively choosing to not show or to show much less or to approach how I went about showing differently, it was then weaponized to be used in a similar way when I had built this reputation of being able to do things and work with these difficult horses and bring horses along and solve problems in a way where I could do it quickly. But like at its core, like I was learning that the way that I was doing things quickly to like fix these horses, even when I wasn't using quick fix training gadgets and whatnot, like it was riding the horses through a lot of their stress and not actually dealing with the underlying causes of stress. It was essentially just teaching them to suppress their communication in one way or another and just go through the motions of riding. It wasn't teaching them to enjoy their job. It wasn't prioritizing their experience. It wasn't any of that. So then I started to become uncomfortable with this. And then that meant that I had to completely restructure the type of clientele that I was attracting and start saying no to things and turning down clients. Which initially, I think part of why I resisted this change in the first place was because when I was establishing myself as a trainer and I needed to make money to live, I didn't have the freedom to really speak my mind in a really cut and dry, 
blunt way where I was like, no, I'm not willing to do that. That I'm uncomfortable with that. I don't think that's ethical. I would kind of have to pander to the clients to a certain degree and try to find something in the middle where it wasn't as harsh as what they might have wanted, but where I could find something that I was more comfortable with. But I didn't have the freedom to really take a hardcore perspective on the way that I wanted to go about doing things because I needed the money. And in order to like protect my sanity during those moments, I was in denial of certain things because I didn't want to fully accept them because it would have to essentially admit to myself that I was selling out on my morals to a degree, which I was doing because I needed to survive. And like, honestly, to some extent, in all aspects of the world, there are parts of our soul that we have to sell out to a degree just to survive. And that we have to do things that we don't necessarily support or agree with just to survive like for example this computer that i am recording this on right now and then the cell phone that i post on social media on the batteries for them are from cobalt mining which is derived from slave labor and really unethical things that i don't agree with whatsoever and i find it abhorrent and disgraceful but at the same time in order to do the most good that i can personally do in the world i kind of do need these products to survive And it's not that I want them to be achieved in the same way that they are, because ultimately it's a responsibility of the multi-billion dollar companies that are enabling this that could absolutely go about things more ethically. But it doesn't mean I agree with the way that it's done. It's just something that it's like you kind of have to accept and just go through the motions. Like there are so many injustices in this world that we kind of have to tune out to a certain degree or just accept because we can't imminently change them. And that doesn't mean we're in agreement with them. But with that said, I do think it's all of our responsibility to speak out against injustice and to use our voices for good, even if we can't immediately change things. So anyways, that's a long winded way of saying that I did definitely sell out morals to a certain extent. And that led to me kind of stagnating my own growth because the idea of accepting that I was enabling things that I didn't agree with by where I was working and like what my clients wanted that was too painful to accept at the time. But then it kind of hit a point where it was unbearable and I couldn't take it. And honestly, like, honestly, I had like a bit of a minty beat. I like had a, I snapped. And this was like probably two, like between two and four years ago, because it was a lengthy minty beat. It was a long one where I was essentially pushing myself to the point of burnout because I was working with so many horses and I was working so hard year round with very little breaks. And I was also doing this in a way where it wasn't aligning with like what I actually fundamentally believed in. And it was also robbing me of time that I could spend with my own horses. So I started to get really bitter and resentful and angry. And I was like taking like three naps a day, partly because I was so physically tired, but honestly I was like depressed and I wasn't happy and I was like burning out to the point where I was like hitting the point of no return. And I was kind of looking at it from the standpoint of why am I doing all this if I can't even work with my own horses? Why am I doing all this if I'm surrounded by environments that I personally feel are toxic to me and my growth as a person? And I was like, why am I doing any of this? And I was starting to lose my love for horses. And I was just like at my freaking breaking point because I just was so physically and mentally exhausted and it just seemed like it was one thing after another and like I would try to go about things in a way where it was like most in tune with what I was comfortable with but it still wasn't enough and I still was feeling really jaded and salty because I wasn't getting like the benefit in terms of monetary income wasn't worth the sacrifice that I was having to make for my morals and also the sacrifice that was barely being able to do anything with my own horses because by the time I was done work, I only had the energy to just do the stuff that was necessary to take care of them. And it was really hard. So I ended up hitting a breaking point where I was like, I can't do this anymore. And I took like a huge step back from taking on regular clients and started to become way more picky about the way that I went about doing things. And this was kind of the result of like one being in really toxic environments that I had a hard time coping with long term, such as working in the racing industry. Like not everyone's toxic. That's not to say everyone is. But when I worked at the racetrack for like the summer that I did, 
there was a lot of racism that I saw and just a lot of really misogynistic, toxic behavior in addition to like unfair treatment of horses. And when I went about things my way to do things in the kindest way possible, not all trainers were receptive to that. And then I would get blamed for situations where the trainer effectively put me in a dangerous situation. And then when the dangerous thing happened, they blamed me for not being able to avoid it when it was like the result of one, how the horses are kept and two, their expectations for the horse and just like expecting the horse to work through stress. And then I would get blamed for somehow not being able to prevent the inevitable from happening. So it was very toxic. And then the other aspect of it was that I had a few clients who initially sounded amazing. They were like, I just want my horses to be happy. I just want their needs to be met and I want them to enjoy training and for it to be what's best for them. And I was like, okay, fantastic. I can go about things the way that I want. I can do the long, slow training process. Da, 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 da. But as what has happened more than once, honestly, as they started to see progress in the horses, they wanted more. They wanted it to go faster. They wanted things to happen quicker. They wanted the horses to be worked longer, even if I didn't think they should be. They wanted them to be worked more regularly with, even if they had physical problems that made it so that they shouldn't be worked as hard as they wanted them to be. And they wanted all this stuff to happen no matter what. And I was not comfortable doing it. So what I finally did, this was like a huge shift in the way I went about things is I just didn't do it. I did things my way. And then that resulted in having a falling out with certain clients. Some accepted it and have stayed around, but others were like, I don't want this anymore. I want the horses to progress faster. And I was like, okay, cool. I can't do this anymore. And the part that's so devastating about that too is like, not only is it like the loss of your identity, like as a trainer and like having the same level of opportunities that you might have with, if you're willing to do things the fast way to the detriment of the horses, but also it's like, if you like these horses, if you've developed bonds with these horses and you really enjoyed working with the horses, it's devastating in that regard because then you're walking away from these animals knowing the type of situation that they're likely to go into and you just have to say goodbye to them and never see them again and it's after you've built these relationships with them so that's really really hard but also it's necessary for my mental health because otherwise the only alternative was for me to stay in an environment that was slowly causing me to waste away and just be really fundamentally unhappy so the loss of these opportunities was honestly kind of a blessing in disguise because at the time I was really upset about it, but it ended up leading me to a place where I'm much more at peace and happy and where I've been able to get to somewhere where I have, I'm coming through that dark night of soul. And on the other side, even though it, there was a lot of loss, res- like that was part of that. And another layer of this is like with Milo's hoof issues and the amount of time off I had to give him from like 2020, like on and off all the way through like 2023, basically, or like the beginning of 2023. Like it's only within like the last year that I've been able to bring him into more consistent work and actually have it be a situation where he's enjoying it and not miserable. That was a really hard situation because I was met with the problem where it's like he didn't even want to work for food. He was so miserable and had such a bad association with work that when I finally started giving him the choice, he said no all the time. He didn't want to do anything. And it really hurt my feelings. He didn't even want to do it for food, no matter what. And he's very food motivated horse. So it was just really upsetting. And then also with the hoof issues and like the hoof journey, it took a long time. It took a long, long time because he had such substantial and significant hoof issues that he'd had for a long time. And then also the physical musculature issues that those caused. And then they were kind of competing with each other in that like he'd built muscles to like accommodate standing on shitty hooves. And he had postural differences that were to allow him to do that. So he was fighting against his own posture and muscle tone in addition to trying to develop do hoof angles so the posture and like how he wanted to carry himself and move around exacerbated some of the hoof issues and it was kind of this like never-ending cycle so it took a long time and he also had such long toes low heels and just like was just sore for so long and like to the point where it's like yeah we could keep him comfortable in the pasture with like hoof boots or casts or form of hoof or shoes in certain situations but he wasn't comfortable working he was miserable working he had a really negative outlook on doing stuff with me in work because of how long he'd been stressed and uncomfortable throughout and I basically had to give him a complete reset and like he's my favorite horse to ride 
So I was really sad about that. And it was a really hard sacrifice to make. And so during all this time where I was struggling with like the ethicality of clients and kind of going back and forth with how I wanted to show up in the horse world and who I was as a horse person and what I would accept as training and clients and what I'm willing to do during all that time, like my favorite horse was also out of commission. And I thought that I felt that I'd lost a sense of self from that too, because so much of my identity as a trainer and just horse person in general has been created by him. But this was like the next leg of my learning journey to kind of completely have my foundation that I'd built just completely rupture so that I had to build a new and better one. And Although it was really hard to go through the situation that I did with him, because honestly, there's times where I was like, I don't think we're ever going to fix him. I think that he's going to just be where he's going to be a pasture pet. Or even at times where I'm like, what if like his feet never get better? And then we end up eventually needing to put him down. And it like, it really rocked my identity as a horse person, but it also forced me to show up for him in a different way as like a partner and to start to enjoy groundwork more and just start to enjoy letting him be a horse more and to just give him opportunities to just have a complete mental and physical reset and restructure and to just become a happier horse as a result. And it led to me learning how to enjoy groundwork more. And also Banksy played a role in that because he was too young to ride for so many years. So I had to start to learn how to do things in a way where I was prioritizing doing more groundwork. And Harlow also played a role in that too, because she was so stressed out her saddle for so long. And then she had her head shaking issue where I had to do like a lot of long, slow stuff. So it was kind of all of these things were happening around the same time. I had a young horse that I couldn't ride. I had a horse with horrible feet that was needing a complete reset and hated everything to do with work. And then I had a mare who was really talented, athletic and awesome and was sound overall, but developed this head shaking issue that we couldn't find a cause of initially. Like initially the thought that it was the, that it was photosensitive photosensitivity. But then I noticed that no matter what, like during light, it wasn't, nothing was working. So then I went about it in my own way, despite the fact that like the vet's initial perception was that it was photosensitive head shaking. And I started to do like stretching and lots of body work with her and just groundwork that was prioritizing getting her to stretch out her neck because her nuchal ligament was so tight and her neck was so tight. And I was like, okay, maybe she's getting headaches. Maybe there's something going on in the pole area. So she too had like a complete body reset that was like at least a year off just doing nothing other than stretching and long, slow distance work. And again, it's like really just this year and last summer that she's really coming back into work. And so there was all of these things that were just crumbling at the same time. And I was kind of left to be like, okay, like, so now I can't take on the same clients because I'm wildly unhappy feeling forced to do things that I don't feel are ethical. And I also don't have horses that I can ride right now. So it's like, who am I? Like, what am I supposed to do? And then it was just like, it was so hard. Because also during this time too, the property that I was living at before got put up for sale. And there is some stuff that was going on that was like not really fair to us as tenants and was just too stressful. So we got the hell out of there, even though we had the right to stay as tenants. So that fell apart. And then I moved somewhere where I didn't have access to an arena, but my horses had way better turnout, which is where I am now. And that was all great. Like it was really good for them. So I was like happy about the amount of space that they had and how much more land they had to live on and how much happier it was making them and how much fitter they were from moving around so much more. But then I was also like, now I don't have an arena. So that part of my identity also crumpled too. Cause it's like, I can't do arena work. What am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to work at Liberty? How am I supposed to do all of these things? And like, what is my riding career going to look like now? Because like, I, I don't know where this is going. Like, am I going to have to haul out all the time to ride in an arena? That's a lot of work. So all of these things were kind of happening within like the same few years. And it just felt like everything was crumbling down to nothing. And so my identity just like crashed. Like it was kind of getting picked away at over the course of years. And then it just ruptured pretty much all at once where I was just like, oh my God, like where I, I felt like I was starting to find myself, but then I started to have conflict with like, how I felt about where I was working in the horse industry and like how I was showing up as a trainer and the way that I went about things. And then, yeah, everything crumbled. 
And like over those years, like I had clients peppered in that like allowed me to do things the way that I wanted to do and that were way more positive reinforcement minded. And then I got to do things that, that I wanted to do. And I noticed how much better I felt about things like that, how much better I felt not feeling pressure to fulfill a quota or a timeline for a client, no matter how it impacted the horse, how much better I felt noticing that I was actually helping these horses become better horses, helping them be easier to find homes in the future and like helping them to let go of stress and just become the horse that their owner wanted to. And it made me feel fulfilled and it made me feel good. And that in comparison to how I was feeling when I felt pressured and stressed by clients that were pushing me to do things at a certain pace or to fulfill quotas in terms of what they wanted their horse to do, that was like way more freeing. And I noticed how much better it made me feel. So eventually like the move happened. Milo was having time off. Harlow was having time off. Banksy was not started because he was a baby and we had all of these things that were just going on all at once. And I like had to like either fire a bunch of clients or it just naturally came to an end because I wasn't willing to do what they wanted me to do. And then my identity just kind of fell apart. So then this is like 2023 now, right? Where I was basically having like a complete rebirth because also like over the years too, my ADHD diagnosis completely shifted my identity because now I suddenly knew about this part of myself that I just thought was always fundamentally wrong. So having an explanation for why I thought differently gave me the path to really discovering who I was and embracing parts of myself that I had previously been masking and shutting down. So that coupled with all the horse stuff going on, coupled with the education and like what I was learning about horse behavior and like all of the new people and mentors that I was being exposed to through that realm and what I learned from them and how it completely shifted the way that I felt about the horse world, coupled with the move, coupled with both my horses being off, coupled with having to essentially rebrand my business, all of that stuff kind of culminated to create an environment where I just had to change. And honestly, like a huge shift started in like 2023 as well, where it was like, okay, now I'm free from the pressures of the types of clients that were making really half me really unhappy. And now I have more time to work with my horses and do groundwork. And now I have taken all the pressure off of myself to feel the need to fulfill a quota for my own horses and to just enjoy doing nothing and to not feel bad about not doing anything and to just do like really simple stuff and to just enjoy them and to kind of rebrand and rebirth the way that I approached my horses and like equestrianism as a whole. Because before, even as like how I was training shifted, I didn't really have time because I was so busy with clients to put into practice the shifts that I wanted to make for my own horses. I was really just doing a lot of stuff that was related to just working like to take care of them. So 2023, having less clients and being able to prioritize doing more online stuff like online consults with people who want to get into positive reinforcement, doing my Patreon, doing the store and stuff that gave me the freedom to not have to rely on clients as much to make a living and to be okay financially. So then I could start to work with my horses more. So then I started, I started out small where it's like, okay, I'm going to just try to get them out like once a week and do stuff with them once a week. And then I started to really enjoy doing that. So then I started to do more. And then on weeks where I wasn't feeling well or the weather was bad, I took the pressure off of myself for feeling guilty or feeling like we were going to lose progress because I was like, they're out on a huge turnout. Now they're moving out way more. And I notice how much fitter they are now. It's not the end of the world if I don't get them out all the time. It's fine if I'm just going to feed them. It's okay. And then that just bought me more freedom. And I started to feel really good about things. I started to enjoy working with my own horses more. And I started to really find who I was as a person. So I was coming out into the light on this dark night of soul that had been this number of years where I was losing my identity as a horse person losing the place that I lived that I thought I was going to stay at for a while, losing clients that I had kind of used to bring value to me as a professional and that were robbing me of my own sanity, losing relationships where I was in an emotionally abusive relationship and being put in a position where I was losing parts of myself because I was trying to fulfill what they wanted me to be and having to like mask and hide parts of myself in order to do that. And it was robbing me of who I was and robbing me of my life without me even realizing. So losing that, losing friends who 
either didn't align with what I was doing differently in the horse world and felt called out by opinions and ideas that I shared online or friends that had been using me for clout online and using me for free products and using me for like free board for their horses and stuff like that. Like it was like cleaning house over the course of a few years. And even like more recently near the end of 2023, like I had another dark night of soul where it's like I ended a relationship where everything seems too good to be true, which it was. And then it ended up being really manipulative and emotionally abusive near the end and just really not in line with like my values as a person and how I wanted to be treated. And that was kind of like a final straw in terms of me wanting to show up being the person that I want to be and me no longer taking that level of treatment because that was kind of the catalyst that I needed to really realize like I can be happy on my own I don't need a man or any other person romantically in my life to make me feel good about myself as a person I don't need that I'm happy now I'm happy doing my own thing and if I meet someone it's just like a fun bonus to the life that I have now and I've also prioritized curating a group of friends that make me feel good about myself so it's been this cat like this all of these things have culminated over the course of a few years to really create like a rebirth. And like 2024 in specific, I think is going to be an even bigger year of rebirth because I've done all of the legwork to kind of like cut ties with things that no longer served me and that no longer felt good to surround myself with people that made me feel good and to also alter my mindset to be one that's more encouraging of me to feel good and to do things that make me feel good and to set up opportunities to allow that to happen. So like working with my own horses, taking all pressure off, not trying to fulfill quotas, be it for clients or social media, spending more time doing stuff for myself, getting hobbies outside of the horse world to do stuff with myself for myself, hanging out with friends more in completely non-horsey things. And just like, having all of this stuff come together where it's like, I'm finally starting to actually really live for myself more. And I've been learning more about myself through like reading and like new mentors and learning more about like human psychology and spirituality and just like different ways that I want to see the world and having it kind of be reaffirmed, like things that I already felt internally, just be like outwardly reaffirmed by way of like content that I access. That's like, okay, this is what I want to do. Or just simply by the crowds of people I'm surrounding myself with now where I'm safer and more aligned with like being myself. Because even if they don't agree with everything that I do, it's a safe place where it's not going to be at the risk of like the relationship fracturing. So I have more safety and security, both like internally in myself with how I feel about myself and then also with like the relationships that I've built and how I'm showing up with my horses and how I'm running my business now and all of that stuff like it's all kind of come together now so this is going to be like a big year of rebirth for me but honestly there is so much darkness like my life has not been easy and this isn't like a woe is me thing to be like feel bad for me but there's been a lot of trauma and stuff that has happened and like honestly like for the last like 15 plus year no more than that like since I was like seven till now basically and like even just like the last few years like we've hit a point in my life and like with my family where we've had a level of peace for the last couple years that has not been present for decades prior and it's not even that everything has gone perfectly but it's just that the things that have come to disrupt the peace haven't been as persistent and chronic and bad so even though there's still been struggles there's been a sense of peace that I haven't been able to feel for a very long time so I think all of these things have come together to really shift how I perceive horses but it was reliant on me going through like a really dark time and basically having like a complete ego death and dark night of soul to get here and like through the darkness and those times like it was really hard I'm not going to lie. Like there was times where I didn't have faith that things were going to get better, like with Milo's hooves and stuff and like with the other horses. And I just, I felt like I was losing parts of myself and I was losing the love that I had for horses because without my identity being tied to like competing and having competition goals and training horses for competition and being this trainer that had like amazing fast results at any cost, 
losing that part of my identity. Like I didn't know who I was in the horse world anymore. I didn't know how I was going to show up in the horse world anymore. And I had to discover that. I had to look for that. But until I made that discovery, I felt freaking lost. I felt really uncomfortable. I felt really sad and I was grieving parts of myself that no longer aligned with me that I couldn't comfortably continue having aligned with me, but that I really in a way missed and kind of missed the blissful ignorance that wasn't realizing all of the stuff that I realize now. However, even though I didn't like consciously realize it back then, like I was unhappy. I was more frustrated. I was more defensive. I was more angry and I was more depressed during all those times. And I was just easily flustered and I could barely do like anything for self-care because everything else was just so overwhelming and just everything in my life was in disarray. And now I feel myself getting more organized and actually seeing like a path in the future and seeing a direction that I want to head. Whereas for years, I felt directionless. I felt unmoored. I didn't know where I was going. I didn't know who I was or what I wanted to be. And I kind of hit the point where it's like, yeah, I I don't know who I am. Like, I don't really know what a lot of my likes and dislikes are. I don't really know how I feel about things. I didn't even know like how I wanted to dress for a number of years because I was doing it all for other people. And having all of that, like the facade of all of that, like the mask that I was putting on just drop meant that I was like for a while felt like a faceless person where it's like, I don't know who I am. I don't know what I want. I don't know like what makes me me. And that's not a that's not a comfortable place to be in, but it was necessary. And it's obviously easy for me now that I'm like out on the other side to be like just do it, just push through and do it because like while this was all going on, like I didn't have faith that it was going to get better. I didn't have faith that I was going to figure things out. I didn't have faith that there was going to be a light at the end of the tunnel. And I felt really lost and it was really dark and uncomfortable. But now that I'm out on the other side, I can say, yes, that's the case. And sometimes what you need to really make the most meaningful changes to yourself is to have everything collapse. And it sucks. It's awful. But sometimes you need to have everything collapse and essentially devastate you to a point where you go no more no more of this. I'm not going to accept this anymore. No more. And that's happened to me in relationships too, where it was like the last one I had was like the final catalyst where I need kind of was like, I'm not going to accept this anymore. This sucks. These relationships have brought me more grief than they have happiness. Never again. And I needed it to be bad and I needed it to be that horrible and difficult for me to really have that final no more. Because all of the other previous times, I just let things continue for too long. And I tried to stick with the familiar discomfort and discontent and unhappiness and just this pervasive feeling that this was wrong and it wasn't what I wanted. And I couldn't really put my finger on exactly why. And I kind of looked at it as like, oh, well, like, what if it's not better on the other side? Like, this is the way things are supposed to be. Nothing in life is perfect. Da, 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 da. But I stuck with the familiar unhappiness rather than letting that all collapse and going into the unknown and then potentially finding like the utmost happiness on the other side. And it led to me being unhappy for a lot longer than I would have been if I had just felt that immense discontent and unhappiness and unknown and discomfort all at once. Like, it, And it's really hard to feel all at once. But if I had felt it more so more potently back then, it would have brought me through the doorway that I needed to go through to find greater happiness sooner. But I prolonged it and I sought out ways to try to stay within a relative comfort zone, even though I was fundamentally uncomfortable. Like I, I stuck with familiar patterns and familiar belief systems and just like enabled things that I wasn't actually okay with because it was what I had known for years. And it prolonged how uncomfortable and unhappy I was because the pain that you feel when you just let all of those facades drop and when you go into the unknown, it sucks. But when you feel it and you grieve it and you get through there, you hit a point where you realize like, wow, I survived this. Like I could feel that amount of pain and come out on the other side and be okay. I could feel that amount of pain. And I can still find myself after it. And then that gives you a level of confidence where it's like these things that were making you unhappy and that didn't feel right. You go like, I can survive if that happens again. 
And that's kind of where I've hit with like my horse journey as well, where it's like, I have already watched the horse world as I know it crumble before my eyes and have to rebuild my understanding and have so many belief systems that I held onto so desperately just be proven completely untrue. I've already watched that happen. So if new information comes out that does that again, like I know I can handle it. I've already done the hard work and I know I can handle it. And that level of confidence means that you're like, the unknown becomes less scary because if stuff comes out that calls to question stuff, I believe now, like I'm prepared to deal with it. I've already done it once. And similarly, like if I get into a relationship where I'm unhappy again, like I know I can be okay on my own. So I'm not going to be as reliant on that person to try to fill a void that they ultimately can't fill. And that if I try to make them fill, I have to be disingenuous to myself and I have to sell out myself to allow them to do that. And also sell out on my own goals and ambitions in order to accommodate that person in my life to the degree to make them like the center of my attention. So now I know I can do it on my own. I can be happy on my own and I don't need any of that stuff. So if I get my heart broken again, it's like, yeah, it'll suck, but I know I can survive it. And that has brought me a lot more confidence, but it was reliant on going through that really dark night of soul, which sucked. And it sucks not knowing where you're headed, but honestly, it's part of the process. You can't have a rebirth without having things collapse and come to an end. And that's the way it's going to be is if you're really questioning the way things are going in your horsemanship and how you feel about horses and that something just doesn't feel right. Acknowledge the fact that it doesn't feel right. Acknowledge the fact that you're not fully comfortable with the way things are going and consider making a change as uncomfortable as it might be. And as it might feel like you're completely losing a sense of self, but recognize the fact that you could be welcoming a new sense of self that is way more in line with what you want and way more authentic to who you are. And the temporary discomfort that you'll feel in the process of getting there is abundantly worth it for the happiness that you're going to find on the other side. But you have to let those structures and belief systems collapse and you have to lose that sense of old self in order to find your new self. It's a necessary part of the process in order to find that new aspect of self. That doesn't mean it needs to happen all at once because honestly, sometimes that's too much. And like for me, it didn't happen all at once. It was like a bunch of things leading up to it, right? But allow those parts of yourself to fall away if they no longer feel like they align with what you want. Allow yourself to be reborn and accept the fact that sometimes you have to see a death of like things that you know, a death of life as you know it in order to have that rebirth. And while there's grief to come with letting all of that stuff go, and that's a natural part of the process, and while there's going to be instances where you sink into old habits when you're stressed or you're unsure, and where you'll regret doing it because you're at a point where you're recognizing that's not what you want to do, that's a part of the process. I didn't just become a positive reinforcement trainer overnight. I made mistakes. I regressed in training, and I would use more punishing tactics that weren't in line with what I wanted to do. But the difference is, as I was changing, I would recognize where I was going wrong, whereas before I would have justified it. I would recognize and go, that's not what I want to do anymore. And the more I did that, the easier it became to just become a new person and to stop resorting to tactics that I no longer stood for. So it's not about having these things happen overnight. Like It takes practice. Unlearning is a lot harder than learning from scratch. And There's a lot of emotional ties to it because so much of your memories and who you are as a horse person have been built off of these certain mindsets. So letting them collapse your grieving parts of yourself and your grieving past memories and your grieving things that you used to think were true. And it's sad. And that is totally valid to be sad. And it's also totally valid to make mistakes and regress to comfortable old behavioral norms while you're in the process of changing. But how you know that you're actually changing is when you recognize that you're doing that and you go, this is not what I want to do. And you start to catch yourself earlier and earlier before you get to the point of frustration or desperation or sadness where you resort to doing things that aren't in line with the person that you are becoming. And you catch it earlier and earlier and you do these things less and less and less and you are engaging in these problematic behaviors less. And that is a sign of sure growth. You do not change your horsemanship goals and like who you are as a person in horse training and how you handle your horse overnight. Even if you really desperately want to make that change, there's going to be moments where you're at your wits end, where you've had a stressful day at school or work, 
and where you cannot show up for your horse to the degree that you should have, especially if you're still trying to fulfill quotas where you're like, I came here to ride, so I need to ride. But you're not in the frame of mind where you can be patient with your horse. So part of that process is going to be recognizing when you're triggered and when you're not in the frame of mind to really be there for your horse and be the calm partner that they need and where it might be better to just go hand graze them or just go sit in their paddock with them and just chill and just have a nice calm day where neither one of you is going to be triggered from the other. And it's recognizing those things and just changing the natural course that you would have taken as your previous self and doing things the new way doing things the way that's in line with like who you are becoming and what you want to stand for long term. But it takes practice. And you aren't being disingenuous to yourself. You aren't being you're not being a liar by making those mistakes. That's part of the human process. And part of the problem in this world is that people aren't honest with the mistakes that they make. They try to hide them. And there's this air of like trying to be perfect and trying to come across a certain way. But it's really not the fact that you're making mistakes that matters. It's how you respond to those mistakes. If you're perpetually enabling toxic behavior and harmful behavior to your horses and whatnot, then you're not learning from your mistakes. And that's the problem. It's not the fact that you've made those mistakes in the first place. It's the fact that you're not learning from them and that you're enabling yourself again and again and again, and that you're not taking accountability. And I would say like, that's my biggest frustration in the horse world now is the lack of accountability, how people will do really unkind things to their horses that are provably unkind and that are provably harmful with lots of empirical evidence, but they deny it. And it's not even the fact they're doing the things that's the biggest problem. It's the denial and the lack of accountability. But that is a protective mechanism that is there to protect their ego and protect the dismantling of that sense of self that they're not ready to let go of. So I understand it, but it's frustrating to watch because it's impeding a lot of positive growth that would be so beneficial to the horses and would also help people to be so much happier. Because I think part of the reason why a lot of these people doing traditional methods are so frustrated and so punishing and so tied to enabling that aspect of themselves is because like deep down, I think there's something in their soul that knows it's wrong and it doesn't feel right. And that just like lights a fire and kind of increases their frustration and increases the likelihood of them responding to things poorly, which seems counterintuitive, but you don't necessarily know why that feeling is there when it's there. You don't know exactly why you're being triggered emotionally in the way that you are. You don't really know until you know. Like, I didn't know that the reason why I was so unhappy for years was because I wasn't being genuine to myself and was because I didn't feel comfortable with things that I was doing to horses because I was just going off of what I was taught to believe rather than developing my own perception of the way things should be and doing my own learning. I was kind of just out there to people please and just be spoon fed what I was taught by my mentors at the time. And even when I was uncomfortable about things that they taught me to do, I was too much of a people pleaser and too scared to speak up and voice that because I was worried about the outcome. I was worried about how they would react. And I was worried about how things would go when Really, if they had reacted poorly, it's like that just shows they're not in line with what you want and you can move on from there and do things differently. So it's been a long journey. It's been really hard at times. There's been a lot of times where I've wanted to give up and there's been a lot of times where I haven't been sure I'm on the right path, but that is part of the journey. And you have to watch your old self die in order to see the rebirth of your new self. But it is worth it in the end, even if it doesn't feel like things are falling into place as they are. You kind of have to figure out a way to just accept the disarray and just allow things to just be and to just trust the process and then reap the benefits of that in the long run. If you take off all expectations for yourself and your horses and you just put trust into the process and you put trust into the fact that you're just that that things will work out the way that they're meant to, then they generally do and it takes a lot of the pressure off of when you're trying to create a specific outcome especially on a specific timeline. And yeah, you just got to get comfortable with the discomfort that is learning your new self because it is something that's new. You're not going to be comfortable with something that's an unknown and that's new to you, especially when it means walking away from things that have been so integral to your sense of self for so long. But just because they've been that doesn't mean that it's actually your true sense of self because sometimes we pick up aspects of ourself that were taught to us by other people and weren't actually like authentically how we want to be. 
So this is a very long winded way of saying that like part of the journey is discomfort. Part of the journey is not knowing who you are, what you want to do, how you want to show up in the horse world and like what you stand for. Part of the journey is being frustrated and upset with the way things are going and feeling lost and feeling torn in two different directions and not knowing which way to go. Part of the journey is watching all of these things fall apart before your eyes and not know what is going to be born out of that destruction. And it's very uncomfortable. But the discomfort doesn't mean that you're headed in the wrong direction. And sometimes you just have to watch things absolutely crumble to the ground in order to build something that's much more lasting and worthwhile and in line with what you want to be like as a person. So in short, I have become a completely different person over these last few years than what I was even three years ago. I am learning who I am more every single day. And I'm trying to remain authentic to that because I'm worrying less about if people think that I'm lying or I'm trying to be someone I'm not, or if I'm trying to put on a certain facade for social media, because they don't know who I am. They know who I was presenting myself as for however many years they've been seeing my content, but they don't know what aspect of myself is actually the most authentic and true to myself. And the fact that people have watched me change in time online doesn't mean that they know what feels most in line with my soul. I know that. Only I know that internally. No one can tell me who I am. No one can tell me when I'm being most honest and true to myself other than myself. So if people think that I am trying to be someone I'm not or that I'm trying to put on a mask, that's their problem, not mine. And honestly, it's more of a projection of how they're probably feeling internally than it is anything about me. And that's the other thing to note is that a lot of the times the way people respond to you has way more to do with themselves than it has to do with you. A lot of the time they're responding to something internally that makes them uncomfortable. And that's something you've said is triggered, especially when you're just making generalized comments that aren't like if it's a personal attack, then yes, you're trying to trigger them. But when you're sharing your thoughts and perspectives and it's just generalized opinions, if they feel triggered and attacked by that, then that says more about them than it does about you. It doesn't mean that what you're doing is wrong or that you shouldn't be your authentic self. A lot of the times that we trigger people the most are because we're bringing out something that they feel internally and that they're not ready to deal with and unpack. And I also say that as someone who has been triggered a lot of times and who has had these types of reactions. But ultimately, like it's up to me to learn why I was so triggered by that. It's not the other person's job to cater to what I want to see and to essentially create an echo chamber because we need to see things we disagree with. We need to see people that trigger us and bring out areas of us that are unhealed or that are in need of growth. And it's all part of the process. So I'm really grateful for like the things that I've learned over the last few years. And I'm grateful for the changes that I've made as a person because it has made me a lot happier. It's not like a complete process. Like, and it's a never ending process. It's a never ending journey of like rediscovering parts of yourself and like discovering new parts of yourself and meeting new versions of yourself. It's something that happens throughout life. And I also think for me, part of it's also age related because I think between the ages of like early 20s to like mid to late 20s, you see a lot of changes in your priorities, sense of self, the people you keep close to you and all of that jazz. So I do think that a lot of it was age related where it's like as I've matured, my ideals, perspectives and goals and ambitions have really changed. And now they're more solidifying and I'm starting to paint a picture of like what I want that is actually me holding the brush rather than letting other people hold the brush and essentially paint for me what they want or basically have me be holding the brush but other people telling me what to paint. Now like I'm in the driver's seat and I'm choosing to do what I want to do and it's been really freeing and it's made me a lot happier and I enjoy working with horses more now than ever before. And like, I mean, I still need to remind myself from time to time when I'm not being authentic to myself and when I need to change things. Because again, it's not about perfection. There's going to be times still where I revert to old habits that don't serve me and like toxic behaviors like self-isolation when I'm feeling sad or just like remaining stagnant like a lot of times when I was feeling burnt out and upset I would just sit in bed and I wouldn't do anything and I just sit still and go into like a freeze response which is one of the worst things that I could have done I still do that sometimes it's not and it's probably not gonna be something that I'll ever completely stop because when I'm really overwhelmed that's like kind of my go-to thing 
But what I've been doing more is I've been listening to more podcasts. I've been listening to more music and I've been putting my headphones in to essentially have stuff talk to me if the voices in my head are being really negative and difficult and where I'm like, then then when I'm doing these things, I want to go do something because I can't just put my headphones in and just sit there and listen to them. I want to go walking around and like tidying up and like doing stuff with my horses or whatever. And that has been something that has been a great tactic for realizing like stuff that makes me feel better and what makes me more productive. And I've also pr- picked up different hobbies. Like I'm doing kickboxing once a week now, which has been really great because cross training is really healthy and it's got me more out of my comfort zone. And it's something that I've actually wanted to do for a very long time, but that I've just never done. And it's something that's just for me. So that has been really great because it also gets me out and socializing with more people outside of the horse world as well. And I've been meeting up with friends more. I have road trips planned that I want to do this next year. And I have like a bucket list of places that I want to go to. So I have all these things that I want to do to just make myself happy. And I'm still like on the journey of discovering that and trying to stabilize my long term plan more because there's some things that I really, really want that aren't currently in reach, but I hope that they will be soon. And I hope that the more I find who I am as a person, and the more I align with the person I'm supposed to be, the closer I will get to having those things come to me. And that's something I truly believe. And I know this is going to sound like really cheesy and a lot of people don't buy into this stuff, but I do think to a certain extent that you can manifest the life that you want by altering your perspective. Because when I was really negative and I didn't see a way out of my situation and I felt stuck, I remained stuck. And now I'm really trying to show up for life in the way that I want to when I do eventually achieve the things that I want that I don't have now. Because looking back, there's a lot of stuff that I have now that in the past I desperately wanted but didn't have. And now I have it. And back then I wouldn't have ever seen a future in which I had those things. But I have them now. And they came to me unexpectedly. And a lot of times they came to me out of some level of loss or disruption of something. And then something, a new door opened and something else good happened. So if you're going through a dark night of soul where you don't know where you're headed and you feel lost, just know that you're going to find your way soon. And that sometimes you need to be lost to discover what type of path you want to take because sometimes we're lost because we don't know what direction we want to head. So you're lost because there's no clear destination or not even a destination because it's a continued journey. You don't you don't even know what landscape you want to head into. So you're standing with like a bunch of different paths that are just right out of your reach, but you don't know what direction you want to head. So the path isn't going to materialize. And it's going to be really difficult to get there without knowing where you want to go. So sometimes you need to be lost first in order to be found. And sometimes you will discover the best aspects of yourself after losing parts of yourself that you thought were so aligned and connected with you, but really weren't. And were parts of yourself that were less authentic and less in line with who you want to be. So anyways, I hope that this was helpful to people. Please let, like, as always, I always really appreciate it when people share the podcast or like tell me what they thought about it, like any of their experiences, if there's similar ones and just share your thoughts and perspectives and whatever because I I love hearing about that stuff and it's always really rewarding to hear that and to know if this resonates with people because for me like these podcasts honestly are pretty cathartic because I get to talk about things that are meaningful to me at length and even if no one listened to them I think that it would be really healing but having other people feel heard through what I say and have things validated that they haven't had validated before is really meaningful and rewarding to me. And it kind of just reaffirms the path that I'm on and makes me feel good to know that it helps other people kind of find their way. Cause like, that's all I really want. Cause like I was lost for so long and I didn't really have the guidance that I wish that I had. And I didn't really have the support and affirmation that I really wish I had partly because I didn't know where to find it. And I was looking in the wrong places, but I hope that I can give that to people to kind of give them the encouragement that they need to know that they're on the right path. And that really matters to me. So anyways, if you're interested in learning more about like my horsemanship journey and like my life growing up and some of the stuff that I was talking about, like in this dark night of soul over the years and like what has been difficult, I wrote about a lot of that in my book, The Other Side of Horsemanship. 
And you can check that out on my website. There's links of where to buy. And that's another great way to support me. I appreciate it. Some of it is like outdated now because that book is like a year and a half old now. And I've learned so much in that last year and a half. But it is a really good picture of all of the learning years of my life leading up to that. And all that jazz. And eventually I'll update it with some new stuff and I'll write another book eventually. There might be something in the works, hint, hint, hint. hint. So yeah, check that out. Don't forget to check out my Patreon if you're interested in tutorials. Don't forget to check out my shop if you want to shop some good deals and just help support me for what for doing what I do. All of these things that I do online and like with my training and the shop and stuff, these are all like my pillars to try to get to the end goal where I really want to be able to run a training program out of my own farm and really set it up and have it curated to be exactly what I want. Because I think that's one of my struggles too with like training out outside clients at this point is like the boarding situations. A lot of them impact the horses negatively and I can't really out train a management issue. So I really want to make a place that's set up for training that has all the horses needs met and is set up in a way to kind of help bridge the gap between people who've grown up in really traditional show barn style type places where their horses are isolated and help them transition to a more holistic approach and do so at a pace that's comfortable for them and the horse and is also safe for introducing horses that are like really poorly socialized to group turnout and whatnot. So that's my goal. And like having a place that I am running to do that and like setting it up the way that I want would be super beneficial for that because it would just allow me so much more freedom to do what I do. So that is honestly my end goal. That is my long-term ambition. And it's something that I desperately, desperately want. And I hope that I one day manifest it. I hope that on this very podcast, I can one day talk about how long I've dreamed of this and then have that dream finally come to fruition. And I believe in the dream and I'm not going to stop trying to go after it. And I encourage people to do, to, to do the same with their dreams. So don't forget to check out the links down below in the description for ways that you can help support me and what I do. It's always immensely appreciated. I couldn't do any of what I do without the people that support me. And I'm really, really grateful for all of you. And the more I become established and stable in life, the more I want to be able to give back to people and really help people who need it. And that's also really why I want to get to the point where I'm really financially stable and I have like my student loans and all my debt and stuff paid off so that I can help other people who are in situations where they need that help. And right now the best that I can really do is like through talking and sharing my experience and hopefully it's making people feel less alone. So that's the path that I'm taking for now. But I hope to continue expanding the amount of good that I can do for people long term. So anyways, thank you all for listening to the Making Milestones podcast and please let me know what you think and if you enjoyed this. And as always, have a great day. If you're having a rough time right now, my thoughts are with you. And I hope you know that you're stronger than you think you are. And you'll get out on the other side, even if you can't see what the other side looks like right now, you'll get there.